Hi everyone, this is Sam Black with Drafting Archetypes, and today I'm going to be giving kind of a first look overview of Shadows Over Innistrad Remastered. So for patrons, you can follow along with the notes at uh, patreon.com slash drafting archetypes. I might be going out of order a little more than usual on this one. Shouldn't be too hard to figure out what's going on. At the time of recording, there's like one day of 17 lands data. So that tells you some stuff, but you have to take it with a huge grain of salt. I know from past experience, when there's been kind of that first wave of 17 lands data and it's just one day, some of it kind of ends up lining up with what we see later, but it's not unusual for like a couple of cards to have wildly different win rates than where they end up. I've looked at the data. Some of it's helpful. Some of it might not be. So I tried to kind of note where the data says something interesting, but also uh, lean primarily on my experience playing with these cards in the past, of course, in a different context than in this set, but just kind of looking at which cards stood out to me and kind of patterns of what's in the set and stuff like that. So not very data-driven approach, but uh, informed by it a bit. So as far as like the big picture uh, color balance type stuff, according to the data, like blue green has the best win rate and also a vast majority of the best commons early on. I will say that I think blue green has kind of just a lot of standalone good value commons. Like a lot of the stuff that makes clues are just kind of like don't require a lot of context to be two for ones. And that's pretty good. So once more players figure out more of the synergies, that might become less true. Um, like, I don't think uh, Blue Green is a super high synergy deck. There are definitely some clue things that work together in a meaningful way. But also, like, if you don't get there, most of the clue stuff is just kind of independently good. And I also think that the clue stuff is kind of better supported than a lot of the other things. Um, there are a lot of cards that make clues. And so the cl cards like Erdwall Illuminator that makes an extra clue when you investigate and like the mole that gains life when you sack a clue, those things could easily have been pretty bad if there were fewer clue cards in the set, but there's a pretty good density, so they're pretty strong. So um, having stuff like that that isn't a trap kind of goes a long way to helping out the win rates, especially early on, where like some other things that are less supported, like I don't think Madness is very well supported. So it's a lot easier for archetypes that have those things that like you might try to do and not see enough support for, that their win rate's going to be pulled down by people like walking into those traps where I think blue-green doesn't have a lot of that. But I also think the blue and green cards are just good. So I wouldn't be surprised if it stays true. Um... So I just looked through all the commons by colors uh, to try to see like what things stood out. Like after my first day of drafting, for example, I was like, oh, wow, Obsessive Skinner is a common. That's the 1-1 one, one Delirium. Enters the battlefield, put a counter on something like an Iron Shell Beetle. Uh, but then it also has Delirium at the beginning of your opponent's upkeep. Put another plus one, plus one counter on something. You can do that every opponent's upkeep and it seemed pretty easy to turn on delirium and that's a card that used to be uncommon and was pretty good it's game in hand win rate on 17 lands isn't great but it's also like iron shell beetle is a playable card so it's a, the kind of thing that you should play in your deck regardless of whether you're good at delirium and it's also a card that might lead people to drafting badly if they try to enable delirium in the wrong way. And then especially if, you know, you end up with both the worst of both worlds where you're like chasing an impossible dream or you're playing some cards to get delirium, but you still don't get it very often. So that would be a reason to not put a ton of stock in the early stats on Obsessive Skinner, explaining why I like it, despite the fact there are a whole bunch of green commons right now with better win rates than it. So anyway, that was the kind of card where it's like, oh, wow, this used to be a higher rarity. It was a strong card. Now it exists at common. I wonder what other stuff like that there is. So looking at white, there were no real standout cards. Like the card that looked best to me was Thraven Inspector, and it has the highest win rate. Sigardian Priest, the two mana one, two uh, that you can spend a colorless to tap on human. 
is like pretty good, but has some bad matchups. Outside of that, it's basically just like a bunch of three mana sorcery speed removal spells in Angelic Purge and Bound by Moonsilver, or whatever those two removal spells are called. One of them is sack a thing, exile a thing, and one of them is uh, a pacifism type enchantment that you can sack a thing to move it around. As I suspect many listeners know, I'm not very impressed by three mana sorcery speed removal. Like those cards are fine, but they're not a reason to make me draft a color. And when those are kind of like it, the the color is just like those and creatures. And it didn't seem like white has any really impressive synergies either. I mean, this week right now, some context for anyone who doesn't know, because it's weird. There's never been a thing like this before. This set has a rotating bonus sheet of extra cards that like a portion of those extra cards will be in the set each week. So this first week is the tribal package. Next week, which is when the arena open is, will be a flashback package. So the games that are uh, being played now, the games I've played and the games that inform the 17 land stats, have this tribal package. Cards that support, um, you know, humans and vampires and werewolves and spirits and zombies. By the time the arena open happens... Those cards will not be in the set anymore, and instead there will be a bunch of flashback cards. So right now, the uh, synergies that White has from that sheet are uh, humans and spirits matters stuff, but next week it will be flashback cards. And so then kind of the big draws to White will be travel preparations and lingering souls which are uh, travel prep used to be common. It was kind of one of the defining cards of original Innistrad Limited. It's one in a green. Put a plus one, plus one counter on each of up to two creatures, and I think maybe they get vigilance, and it flashes back for a white. It's just a ton of damage and size spread out pretty well, and it makes your things hard to block because you can decide where to put it and stuff. And then Lingering Souls, uh, I suspect more people know of. It's Two and a white, uh, make two one one flying spirit tokens, flashback for one and a black. Four one one flyers for five mana and one card is often totally insurmountable and limited. So those are going to be really big draws to white that just don't exist in the color yet. That's a thing that's happening. Also, I think kind of big picture, it would stand to reason to me that the tribal set or the tribal bonus sheet helps creature-centric linear aggressive decks, whereas the flashback sheet helps outside of Lingering Souls and Travel Preparations kind of slower spellsier decks because it gives you a late game thing to spend mana on on the flashback of your spell. So the format that we're playing this week might seem appreciably more aggressive than the format that we have during the open. So if you're doing a lot of your prep now, be careful to account for the way that the format is different then. My analysis of like which cards look good and most of what I was looking at for this format is focusing on the cards that are not in the bonus sheet at all. So the cards that are in the set now and will be in the set then. That's the context in which I'm looking at this, just to make sure all of that's clear. So anyway, White doesn't seem great to me. <laughs> Long story short there. Blue, ingenious scab, two mana, two, three zombie uh, with prowess, and you can spend a blue to give it plus one, minus one. Has played really well basically every time it's been in a limited set. It's a very strong card. There's also drag under, which is two and a blue sorcery, bounce a creature, draw a card. And I like Jace's Scrutiny, which is one in a blue, target creature gets minus four, minus zero, investigate. Drownyard Explorers, which is three in a blue for a two, four ETB investigate, has really, really good early 17 lands win rate. That's not super surprising to me, like a two, four is a real body and a clue is an extra card. So if you're doing anything vaguely defensive, it's pretty strong. And then I also wanted to note Spontaneous Mutation, which is a blue aura with flash and enchanted creature gets minus one power for each card in your graveyard i think it's a lot better than most cards that it's similar to so it's just something to keep in mind uh if you're good at putting cards in your graveyard um it is a blue swords to plowshares kind of thing where 
you can often functionally invalidate a creature for a single mana at instant speed, which can be a really big deal. Black is weird in this set. Specifically, Black's removal is not on par with Black's removal in most sets. Uh, its common removal is exactly Borrowed Malevolence, which is Black to give something plus one, plus one, or minus one, minus one, and it can escalate to do both of those for like three mana or something. Deadweight, which is an enchantment aura that gives something minus two, minus two. And Certain Death, which is a six mana sorcery that kills any creature and drains your opponent for two. And that's it. So you have some one mana removal that kills small creatures, and then a six mana sorcery speed removal spell that kills other things. So Black is just not good at killing... Like, Black is very bad at doing exactly Black's thing, which is toughness agnostic removal. It's really weird to me. The best Black common, I believe, the standout to me is Giss's Bidding, which used to be uncommon, which is black, black, two sorcery, make two zombie tokens, madness, two and a black. And that card's pretty strong, although enabling the madness is not trivial. So black doesn't seem very good to me, and the stats on 17 lands support that. Uh, blue black notably has the worst win rate of anything uh, of any of the two color pairs although i had a deck that i liked that was blue black spells but i think most of the time the thing that i was doing is just better in blue red basically the the whole madness part of black is pretty under supported because it's hard to there aren't a lot of things that pay you to discard there are things that let you discard so that you can use a madness cost but you're not really getting much out of discarding most of the time. And so a lot of Black's cards are in this like under-supported madness space, and then Black isn't good at removal, so I don't, I don't really get what it's doing. It also has some Delirium stuff, but like outside of Deadweight, it's not especially good at enabling Delirium. Uh, I'm very low on Black and a lot more into uh, the Teamer colors in this set. Red has Galvanic Bombardment, which is red instanced deal two damage to a creature, plus one for each of these that's already in your graveyard. Incendiary Flow, which is one in red sorcery, deal three damage to any target. If, it, if that kills it, exile it, or if it dies this turn, exile it. And then on top of that, less good, Make Mischief, which is three mana sorcery, deal one damage to something and make a devil that does a damage to something when it dies, and so on and on. And Alchemist's Greeting, which is five mana sorcery deal four to something, but it has madness for one in red. All of those are common. So red has much better removal than the other colors. And then it also has Pyrehound, which is really good if you're like the sorcery instant heavy deck. I think like red is very much uh, like the, a lot of the strongest red cards are the removal spells and spells matter stuff. It also, you know, has like werewolf and vampire type synergies. But again, like Madness is a little under supported. I, I think red green werewolves definitely seem, or wolves really more than werewolves. It's a little of both, but pretty wolf heavy. Seems okay right now, especially with the tribal package. But I think when the tribal package is gone, I'm going to be less excited about that. And I think I really want to be blue with red, which is not to say that the other things aren't available. But the red removal pairs really well with the blue card draw and just like spells matter stuff. And then green, green just broadly seems great to me. Narwhal Dryad and Obsessive Skinner are both really strong Delirium cards that used to be uncommon. There are a decent number of Delirium enablers with things like Terrarian and Grapple with the Past at common. And then you have like Byway Courier, which is 3-2 for 3 when it dies, make a clue, and confront the unknown, which is a one-mana instant that investigates and gives plus one, plus one for each clue you control. If you go deep on clues, Bloodbriar, which is the three-mana 2-3 two, three that gets plus one, plus one whenever you sacrifice a permanent, gets very strong, especially if you're also doing Delirium stuff and playing Traveler's Amulet and Terrarian. Then Green has some okay removal with like Rabid Bite and Moonlit Hunt. So I don't know. I, I think green just broadly seems pretty good. That's all just based on the commons, to be clear. And so looking at them, to me, it seems like teamer is better than white and black. White is significantly better than black. Red, I think, is a little bit worse than green. You know, my first thought is 
green a little better than blue a little better than red but all three of those pretty close and then white a little lower and black quite a bit lower would be my initial assessment of the power level of the commons like i said before the early 17 lands data has blue green as the best two color pair followed by green white but blue green by a significant edge and then green white also significantly ahead of third place the early uncommon win rates suggest an aggressive format with Town Gossip Monger, the one mana, one, one white uncommon that can tap it and another creature to transform into a two, three at number one, followed by Nebelgast Herald at number two and Uncaged Fury at number six. All of those are cards that are like really aggressive, good in an aggressive format. Again, sample sizes are tiny here, especially on uncommons and early in a set when people are still kind of figuring out what works having a curve and attacking is pretty reliable. So I wouldn't put a ton of stock in that. Ignoring the data, some uncommons that stood out to me personally, just based on past experience and stuff, in white, Faith Unbroken, which is a four mana aura that gives plus two, plus two, and then kind of Fiend Hunters something. So it exiles a creature as long as you have Faith Unbroken. Swingy, of course, if your opponent uh, kills your creature, it's you know, it's an aura, but if they don't kill your creature, you get this like big hasty attacker and get rid of their blocker. And, you know, it's just super swingy. Griff's Boon, one mana aura that gives plus one plus O oh, and flying. And then you can cast it from your graveyard or return it from your graveyard to the battlefield for three and a white. Near Heath Chaplain, which is three mana for a three one life flank and then from your graveyard you can spend i think three mana and exile it to make two spirits i think it's sorcery speed cards pretty good you know your opponent generally has to trade with it because it has life link and it's a three one so it trades easily and then you you know trade that with a card and then you get a couple of flyers but those are all pretty good white uncommons and white has some other good uncommons. so i think white does pretty well at uncommon then in blue, there's like Erdwall Illuminator, which is the 1-3 flyer for two that whenever you investigate, you get another clue the first time each turn. Ongoing Investigation, which is uh, an enchantment. Whenever one or more creatures damages your opponent, you investigate, and then you can spend one in a green and an exile creature from your graveyard to investigate and gain two life. Rise from the Tides, which is a six-mana sorcery that makes it a tapped zombie for each sorcery in your graveyard. That's the build-around finisher for the spells deck that I think is, like, pretty impressive. I think the, like, almost no creature, bunch of removal spells and bounce spells and card draw spells rise from the Tide deck is pretty strong. In black, there's Fighting Rain, which is, I think, four mana to give all creatures minus two, minus two, and uh, Madness is for three mana. Haunted Dead, which is a four mana 2-2 two, two, uh, zombie that makes a 1-1 one, one spirit when it enters, and you can play it from your graveyard by spending one in a black and discarding two cards. One of the better, like, madness and outlets, sort of. It's a weird one. And then Kindly Stranger is a 3-2 three, for three that you can spend two in a black if you have delirium to transform it into a four three that and then kill a creature when it transforms and indulgent aristocrat which is a one one life linking black vampire you can spend two and sack a creature to put a plus one plus one counter on each vampire you control that one's you know very strong if you have a ton of vampires otherwise it's nothing special kind of and then red has fiery temper lightning axe mad prophet and thermo alchemist fiery temper and lightning axe really good um you know they, they both benefit from madness stuff in your deck but don't require it fiery temper is two in a red instant deal three damage madness for red and lightning axe is red instant deal five damage to your creature discard a card as an additional cost or pay five colorless and then mad profit is a four mana two two haste uh tap to rummage and um it's basically the best way to enable madness because it's the card that most pays you for uh just starting things and then lets you cast them at their madness cost at instant speed and you're off a card for do doing it and then thermal alchemist is uh one red for an o3 that taps do damage to your opponent and untaps whenever you cast an instant or sorcery this is a card that's been around in several sets and is a favorite card of a lot of players. It can uh, do a lot of damage if you are a heavy spells deck and blocks reasonably. It can be difficult to race. And then green has Clear Shot and Duskwatch Recruiter, 
are both really incredible. Clear shot is one on a green instant. Target creature gets plus one, plus one, and then does damage equal to its power to um, another creature. Uh, this is really, really surprisingly often a two for one and giant blow where you like get something into combat and save it and kill something else. And then Dusclatch Recruiter is a really busted werewolf. One and a green for a 2-2. Two, two. You can spend two and a green to look at the top three cards of your library and put a creature from them into your hand. And then it transforms into a 3-3 three, three that uh, makes your creatures cost one less. And then Pack Guardian is not anywhere near as good as Dusclatch Recruiter and Clear Shot, but I think pretty strong. Four mana, four, three. When it enters, you can discard a land to make a two, two wolf. Those are standout uncommons to me to look out for. Again, the data doesn't exactly agree with me about which ones are good. So grain of salt there, but I don't know. Those are cards that I've liked in the past. So there you have it. With all of that understood, my approach to this format right now is that I'm looking to be uh, Green X Delirium or Blue Green Clues or Blue Red Spells or Green White Humans. And I think like Red Green Aggro Wolves is probably good, but not something that I personally really want to draft. Although uh, I do seem to be getting hooked into it with uh, powerful rares in my most recent drafts. That's kind of my first take. I'm gonna turn this over to Twitch chat for questions about anything I've said or just about the format as a whole. That can be logistical questions or questions about, you know, specific cards, archetypes, the set, whatever. As always, I do want to take a moment to thank uh, my newest patron of the week, Mamiyo. Thank you for the support. And for anyone else who's interested in supporting the podcast, check out patreon.com slash drafting archetypes. Question about how many drafts I've done so far. I don't know, seven-ish. I, I haven't checked recently. Some Something like that, I think. Orzov has the second best win rate in best of three, if I recall correctly. Weird, is it? Yes, that does sound weird. Uh, I haven't looked, and the sample sizes are very small, especially for best of three. I have been playing best of three. I have not run into a lot of Orzov. I suspect that it is also one of the least drafted color pairs because i don't really know what the draw to it would be so it wouldn't surprise me if it's drafted very rarely they're somewhat undrafted when people do draft it it's because of really strong rares and then it ends up having a very very high win rate um in a small sample size early in the format um i wouldn't read a lot into that i noticed nothing about madness in your places to be list uh particularly other than blue red yeah i think madness is under supported in the format i think some decks can do some stuff with madness but it's not something i'm looking for is in prison in the moon playable Yes, I think that it is playable. I think it is not great. I think that, you know, it's three mana sorcery speed removal-ish, but giving your opponent an extra mana matters, especially in format with a bunch of clues. And there are ways to destroy it and everything. But it does, you know, answer any creature potentially for three mana. It's uh, not a card that... (laughs) I suspect that I'll play much, but I think that it's not, you know, the most embarrassing card you could play. But I don't know. Maybe I should say no, because I'm never going to play it, but (laughs) it seems fine. I guess what I should really say is I would strongly prefer to have Spontaneous Mutation to Imprisoned in the Moon in most of my blue decks. What are some cards you're liking to help turn on Delirium? I'm struggling to understand during build phase if I'm good at Delirium or not. I am looking to have like an average of three-ish instants and sorceries, ideally like three of each. And then uh, some artifact creatures are nice if you don't have artifact creatures or in addition to artifact creatures. I highly prioritize Terrarium and look to cut a land for Traveler's Amulet. I think it's nice to have some ways to get lands in your graveyard, uh, like something that lets you discard them or mill yourself. Grapple with the past is a good way to pretty often end up with land in your graveyard. And I think Vessel of Nascency, if you can get it, is an uncommon that's really good at Delirium because it puts an enchantment in your graveyard, which is pretty hard in addition to like milling a bunch. So that that one's big. 
And I think it's not necessarily hard for some decks to get enchantment in the graveyard, especially with stuff like spontaneous mutation and dead weight. And you can also play some like positive auras, especially in conjunction with self mill. I think that's most of what I have to offer about getting delirium. Would you consider going toward madness if you saw multiple fiery tempers? Sure. I mean, like I, I do take mad profit early. Like I, I think it's not like it's bad to have madness cards in your deck. I just don't think it's something that you should be looking to get into because I think that it's hard to get the full package, like enough cards that want you to discard that like enough things that have madness and ways to discard that are meaningful um such that I, I just don't assign a lot of weight to it how fast does the format seem to me and what type of average curve are you looking for the format is normal which is to say pretty fast but not anything like one but you know a lot faster than something like strixhaven it is, you know, again, with the current bonus sheet, you know, supporting a bunch of like linear aggro decks. And there are not a lot of werewolves that transform via the old day night thing, but there are some. And that mechanic largely exists to punish your opponent for missing a land drop or like missing it like having a turn early where they can't play a spell and you flip a cheap werewolf. So you do want to have cheap stuff so that that doesn't happen to you. So I don't know. I'm in, I'm looking to have a curve where I spend my mana all the time, but that's true in like any limited format these days. I, I would say the format is fast enough that curving matters, but not so fast that you like have to, that you can't play late game stuff. And because the format has stuff like clues that let you spend mana late pretty easily, it's pretty important to also spend mana early. So I do want to prioritize having a low curve with things to spend mana on on turns like one and two. But, um, you know, if you're spending mana on stuff like Terrarian and Traveler's Amulet that are like helping you get Delirium and also are spells that are stopping your opponent's werewolves from flipping, I think that that's a fine place to be. Is Ruthless Disposal... Oh, it's two things get minus 13, minus 13. I have no idea. Uh, it seems really hard to use. It feels like it's trying to be good, but like discard a card and sack a creature on five mana at sorcery speed? I don't know. I, I, it doesn't read as a card that I would easily find a way to put in a deck. It reads as a card that can be reasonable at enabling Delirium, but I don't know. It's asking a lot. I, I don't think I'm into it. Are you playing the Blue Flash enchantment only with some self mill? Fed mixed experiences trying to use them in decks uh, that will be likely to trade early. So if you're just a bunch of creatures and some of your creatures are like high power, low toughness, and you're like, I bet these things will die, then I don't like spontaneous mutation. Uh, if you're milling yourself or you're just playing a bunch of like, you know, instants and sorceries, especially instants and sorceries that draw cards like take inventory and drag under, then I like it. I don't want it just like I'm a blue creature deck. I bet some of my creatures will die. Then you should not be playing spontaneous mutation. Take inventory. Interesting. Are you playing outside of spells matter contexts? Um, so the only deck that I had with take inventory had three take inventories and Two, Epiphany at the Drown Yard, which is a rare that mills a bunch of cards and also had Rise from the Tides. So that was definitely a Spells Matter deck. I don't think that I'm drafting Take Inventory highly enough to end up with enough of them that I would want to play them if I'm not Spells Matter. So I guess the answer is a, basically a hard no. How many Take Inventory before you want to play Take Inventory? I would say three. And that's assuming that I care that spells matter. And again, I don't think that you're going to end up with... Like, I think that if you have four, the, you might want to play them in, like, most contexts. But I don't know how you have four if you're not spells matter, because I don't know why you took the first one early enough to end up with four. So I think the answer is basically play them with three and only expect to play them in spells matter decks.
Uh, take inventory for anyone who doesn't know is one in a blue sorcery uh, draw card um, for each take inventory you've played. Well, one plus one for each in the graveyard. Looking at recent trophies today, uh, there are a lot of blue, white, and blue, green decks. Uh, would I say that humans and spirits are why white is better in both cases? Yeah, I mean, I do, th like I said, right now, the draw to white is like human aggro and spirit aggro with like those uh, bonus sheets. And, you know, since both blue and green are good and white it's not that the white cards are bad. It's that the white it's that white doesn't have a lot of standout cards, especially at common. But you don't need standout commons. Um, you need standout uncommons, and white does have those. And white has a reasonable curve of creatures um, that can support uh, like blue decks and uh, green decks pretty well. So like white, uh, yeah, it basically it doesn't surprise me that white's doing well with blue and green, especially because we have the tribal set the, uh, bonus sheet thing in right now. And the tribes in this set are in allied colors. And so if blue and green are the best colors, but the set currently wants you to play allied colors, then it makes sense that you end up in blue, white, or green, white. Um, especially if white is better than black and hair is better with green than red does. Also, a lot of those uh, decks play Strength of Arms, parentheses, two copies. I'm surprised it's as good as it is. Thoughts? I mean, plus two, plus two for one mana is an okay trick. And then if you ever get like a body on top of that, it's a great trick. Um, it's not super easy to get a body on top of that, but I don't know. One mana tricks often overperform, so I'm not like super surprised to hear that that's a thing. There's another question. How important is Epitaph Golem, the 5 mana 3 5 artifact creature that you can spend 2 mana to put a card from your graveyard on the bottom of your deck to self-mill decks? I have been playing it because I don't want to risk decking myself and the end game where you get to choose whatever card you want to draw every turn is really, really strong. But mostly I've been playing it because it's an artifact creature for delirium purposes. As to how important it is, I have never had a game so far while playing it in a couple of different decks that actually, where I actually like won because of, well, I don't think I've played a game where I have drawn a card that I put in my deck due to Epitaph Golem. So it doesn't seem super important in general, though it is possible to have to build your deck in such a way that it's more likely to matter than it has for me if you end up with a ton of the self mill stuff. But in general, it's you know more like filler slash insurance in a deck that really really gets there on doing its thing. Interesting, Golem has saved me from decking multiple times. Yeah, I mean. When I played it, it was a deck with Rise from the Tides that was like a pretty strong deck, and I just killed people first. Uh, it wasn't hard to imagine games going in such a way where the Golem did matter. It just didn't actually ever come to that, largely because my opponents just died to Rise from the Tides. And I also had uh, Dark Salvation, which did a ton of work. What Delirium payoffs have you been prioritizing? I know Skinner and Assume, uh, Kindly Stranger. Kindly Stranger is black, so not that one. It's really just for me about Obsessive Skinner and Narwa Dryad, because they're both commons in green, and they're both really, really good uh, if you have Delirium and solid playables if you don't. Narwa Dryad is green for a 1-1 death touch, and then if you have Delirium, it's a 3-3. I suspect there are some higher rarity Delirium cards that are like worth paying attention to, but I can't even think of any uncommons off the top of my head. Uh, that are a really big draw. I mean, like, Kindly Stranger is, you know, nice, but it's black, and I don't know, it's fine. It's a way to get an actual removal spell in your black deck, I suppose. I will say that Dark Salvation was good enough to um, make black feel, like, it was good enough that I was happy to be playing black to have Dark Salvation. Um, that's a rare black XX, uh, Target player makes X zombies, and then target creature gets minus X, minus X, Rex is the number of zombies you control. I think there are some really, really, really strong black rares, 
and black is not so bad that you should avoid it if you have one of those really strong rares. All right, it looks like that's about it for questions. So I'm gonna wrap it up here. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, especially Twitch chat for tuning in and uh, asking some questions. And this set is certainly um, interesting little change of pace here. Um, I do plan to record one more episode about this set uh, next week before the arena open to kind of, you know, update, prepare people for the arena open and factor in the flashback sheet. And uh, that will be the last episode on this set. I do prefer not to put a lot of time into arena only formats i like to uh try to make sure that this podcast is focused on sets that uh people can play regardless of what platform they're using so i don't spend a lot of time on uh the sets that don't come to arena um or the sets that only come to arena but i know there are a decent number of players who uh will play arena only for opens so I, th- I thought it was worth spending some time talking about this. And uh, of course, um, I did put it to uh, vote for the patrons this week and they agreed. So here we are. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I'll be back next week with a kind of closer final look before the open. Um, so uh, that's probably not going to be an archetype deep dive again since I'm only doing two episodes on this format, it's kind of weird to be like, here's this one archetype that's the only archetype in this ever format I'll ever teach you how to draft. So it's going to be another kind of big picture stuff, uh, but presumably with a lot more information. Thanks for listening and have a good week. Bye, everyone. Lightspeed.